There's a moment in the 1988 film Coming to America starring Eddie Murphy where several characters are sitting in a barber shop having one of sort of the all-time conversations about who is the greatest. And this specific conversation happens to be about boxing. And they're sitting around and they're trying to, to, to have a debate about whether it's Cassius Clay or whether it's Joe Lewis or whether it's Rocky Marciano, but who was the greatest boxer of all time? And this is a conversation that we love to have in all kinds of different fields. Uh, who is the greatest basketball player? This is a popular topic right now with the Michael Jordan documentary that's come out. Uh, with the passing of Kobe Bryant. Is it Kobe? Is it Jordan? Is it Shaq? Is it LeBron? We like to think of it in terms of who's the greatest quarterback of all time, or the greatest wide receiver, or the greatest pitcher to have ever thrown a baseball. And we can't ever really solve these things because someone in the course of these debates always says, well, you can't compare different eras. It doesn't make sense to go and have, you know, Muhammad Ali versus Mike Tyson. They're products of different times. Uh, you can't put Dan Marino up against Tom Brady, up against John Elway. It just doesn't make sense. This moment from the film, because it has Eddie Murphy in it, makes me think of a different kind of debate, a different kind of conversation that also involves him, that is 30 years later on this show, uh, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee which is one of my all-time favorite shows that I've picked up. It's on Netflix, and it is funny. You sit, you watch, and you laugh, but it's also one of the deepest, most interesting intellectual conversations about an art form that I think I've ever seen. Just seeing Jerry and these guests that he brings in drive around in this sort of less pompous version of inside the actor's studio, but on wheels. Talk about what it takes to be a great comedian. And they have these little moments and conversations about who is the greatest of all time? Who is that goat comic that did it better than just about anybody else? And one of the things that inevitably these conversations turn to is this sort of lineage of comics throughout the years. You know, going all the way back to, to the early days of Abbott and Costello and sort of vaudeville routines and then moving on to people like Lenny Bruce George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, Chris Rock, on through the years until you get to the present day. And something that comes up over and over and over again is just who was the best to ever do it? And this is a more interesting conversation in some ways because no, we can never see sort of Mike Tyson fight Muhammad Ali, both of them in their primes, although we try to do it, you know, by simulating it through a video game on occasion. But comedians, as artists, have this sort of body of work that you can go back and you can look and you can compare with this stand-up special to this other one, this concert to this other one, uh, this variety show to this other one. And one person that everybody is sort of waiting to see come on this show is Dave Chappelle, who I think many people would point to now as being one of, if not the greatest, to ever do it. And when you talk about Dave Chappelle, it's impossible to bring him up without thinking about Chappelle's show, right? Which was the height of his fame. He did things on that show that nobody has ever done in that genre ever before and likely that we will never see ever again. And it's very telling that once he stopped making Chappelle's show, went off to Africa, came back, started doing stand-up again, but in that vacuum that was left in his wake, nobody has really done it since. Key and Peele were kind of there for a little while, but I would argue that, that what they were doing was fundamentally different. Even though they're both sort of sketch comedy shows, the kind of comedy that they were doing was far less deep and impactful and artistic than what Dave was doing. And I also don't think it's a surprise that it's around this time that Saturday Night Live just sort of went down the tubes. And I think you can make a pretty strong argument that Dave Chappelle just sort of killed the genre of sketch comedy. He did it better than anyone will ever be able to do it, and so why even bother? And the thing that I want to focus on today is not comics, not actors, but poets. 
this is a, a conversation that comes up all the time as well, is who is the greatest of all time? Is it Shakespeare? Is it Milton? Is it uh, Dunn? Is it Tennyson? Is it Wordsworth? Is it Whitman? Poets from across all these different eras, and we try to figure out who was the best to ever do it. And I think like with the point about comedians, to try to actually have a conversation about this, you have to think in terms of genre. And luckily for us, poets themselves throughout history have determined that in order to be the greatest to have ever done it, you have to prove it by writing an epic. You can write all the sonnets that you want, you can write all the plays that you want, you can write all the lyric poetry that you want, but until you step up and write that like 10,000 line masterwork, you cannot stake your claim to being one of or the greatest to ever do it. And whenever you decide to take that step as a poet, that now it is time for you to sort of ascend to the ranks and to take your shot at writing an epic, you're aware of everybody who came before you. And you're also aware of like what the rules of the game are, what the conventions of the genre are supposed to be. One of them is that it has to be epic in scope and also in length, which is one of the reasons students don't like to read them all that much anymore and teachers don't like to assign them. It has to focus on an epic hero, somebody who stands head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of, of abilities or prowess or fame or honor or glory or what have you. It also has to tell the story of a people. It's not just a story about that one guy who did those really cool things. It also tells the story of an entire culture. And so if you sort of trace through the genealogy, if you're going to try to attempt to write an epic poem yourself, today you have to have some awareness of the people who have come before you so that you know sort of what the goal is, how to measure what the work you're going to do stands up against everything that has come before. So the place that you have to start is with Homer. Homer, two different poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The first one that he writes is the Iliad, which focuses on the hero Achilles. It's set in the, against the backdrop of the Trojan War and tells the story of the greatest Greek soldier in the history of Greek warfare. And at the beginning of an epic poem, so you've got to have epic scope and epic hero, you have to tell the story of a people, but there's also this moment at the very beginning where you, you have to invoke the muse because this is such a tall task that no mere mortal can do it on their own. So you have to actually pray to the gods and the goddesses to give you the strength and the power and the insight to pull off this task that you have set before yourself. So at the beginning of every epic poem, there is this invocation of the muse. And Hunger begins the Iliad by saying, Rage. Goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles, murderous, doomed that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighter souls, but made their bodies carrion, feasts for the dogs and birds. And the will of Zeus was moving toward its end. Begin, muse, when the two first broke and clashed, Agamemnon, lord of men, and brilliant Achilles. And so Homer sets the stage here, he's the, the, the first of the goats to ever do this, by invoking the muse and telling us what his poem is going to be about, which is about this tremendous fighter. And he goes on and he tells the story of Achilles and, and his battle against Hector and his death at the hands of Paris and how the Greeks won the war, the Trojan horse, and all of that stuff. Then he comes along and writes a sequel of sorts, which is the Odyssey. And he shifts gears a little bit here. And instead of talking about the greatest, most powerful, manly man that ever lived, he tells us instead about the most wily, the most intelligent, the smartest man who ever lived, Greek man at least. And so he picks up sort of where the Iliad left off. The Trojan War is over. Odysseus is going to head home. It takes him a long, long, long time to get there because of reasons. And he begins this poem in the same way with this invocation to the muse. But it takes sort of a different tone this time. 
This time he says, sing in me, muse, and through me tell the story of that man skilled in all ways of contending. The wanderer, harried for years on end, after he plundered the stronghold on the proud height of Troy. He saw the townlands and learned the minds of many distant men and weathered many bitter nights and days in his deep heart at sea while he fought only to save his life to bring his shipmates home. And so this tells us from the very beginning that this is going to be a different kind of story. He sort of has done the war thing in the previous poem, and now we're going to get a different thing. It's a road trip kind of poem, right? We get a different kind of hero and a different kind of story because he's done the one thing, so now he has to sort of move into new territory, Homer does. A few hundred years later, a Latin poet, Virgil, decides that it's his time to sort of take a shot at the crown, and he is going to write his own epic, the Aeneid. And he picks as his hero a guy named Aeneas, who was present at the Battle of Troy. He was a Trojan, and while the city was on fire, he, he got his family, he got his father, his elderly father, put him on his back and carried him out through the flames, and then through many adventures, sort of similar to Odysseus, wandered over the waves until he landed on the coast of Italy, and then eventually his descendants go and found the great city of Rome. So again, we get this epic story, we have an epic hero in Aeneas, and we have a tale of a people, in this case it's Romans and not Greeks. And Virgil begins in the same way with this invocation to the muse. And this one's a little bit different. He says, I sing. So not the muse sing through me or sing muse, he says, I sing. And I sing of two things, of arms, Achilles, and the man, Odysseus. He sort of takes both of them and combines them into one thing. And he says, I sing of arms and the man. He who, exiled by fate, first came from the coast of Troy to Italy and to Lavinian shores, hurled about endlessly by land and sea, by the will of the gods, by cruel Juno's remorseless anger, long-suffering also in war, until he founded a city and brought his gods to Latium. From that the Latin people came, the lords of Alba Longa, the walls of noble Rome. Muse, tell me the cause. How was she offended in her divinity? How was she grieved, the queen of heaven, to drive a man noted for virtue to endure such dangers, to face so many trials? Can there be such anger in the minds of the gods? And then he goes on and he tells this tale of this guy who sort of is half Achilles and half Odysseus, smushed together. He's both awesome and on the battlefield by the force of his arm, and he has sort of the brains to go along with that brawn. And then, a few hundred years later, an Englishman decides that it's his turn to take a crack at this. And a guy by the name of Edmund Spencer decides that he is going to write an English epic poem. And so he decides to pick as his hero that he is going to focus on. Unsurprisingly, if you had to pick like the greatest hero in all of English history, King Arthur. And he begins his poem with that same invocation to the muse. And he says, Lo, I the man whose muse will own did mask as time her taught in lowly shepherd's weeds I'm now enforced a far unfitter task for trumpets stern to change mine oaten reeds and sing of knights and ladies' gentle deeds whose praises having slept in silence long me all too mean the sacred muse of reeds to blazon broad amongst her learned throng. Fierce wars and faithful loves shall moralize my song. And there's this tone in Spencer here of self-effacement. I'm just this lowly poet, and I'm going to do the best job that I can, and I've set this titanic task in front of myself, and Lord, I need some help. And so he's praying to the muses to come and help him. And then, a few hundred years later, another Englishman comes along, named John Milton. And he decides that he is going to sort of 
take a crack at the crown here and write his epic. But he finds himself in a quandary because if you're going to tell the story of a people and of a hero, he's been beaten to the punch. Spencer beat him to it. Spencer stole sort of his topic away from him. Because if you're an Englishman, who else are you going to talk about other than the great King Arthur? So what avenue is left open to him in this sort of genealogy of marching through the years if we trace it back, going from Homer to Virgil to Spencer to Milton, going from Achilles and Odysseus to Aeneas to King Arthur, where does he go next? And Milton's answer is to cheat. He says, I know exactly what to do. I'm going to change the rules of the entire game. And I'm, I'm still going to have a hero, and I'm going to tell the story of a people, and I'm going to evoke the muse, and I'll do all of those things. But I'm going to do it my way. And so at the beginning of his poem, he starts off by saying, of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world, and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or, if Sion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. For thou knowest, thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, satst brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark illumine, what is low raise and support, that to the height of this great argument, I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. And Milton does a couple of different things here. He says, my hero, the person that I'm going to focus on, instead of sort of marching down through the years through history, sort of who comes next after Arthur, I'm going to cheat and go back to the very beginning. And I'm going to pick Adam, and I'm going to tell his story, the first man. And the, the story of the people that I'm going to tell is not the Greeks or the Romans or the English. It is all of us, the entire human race. That is who I am going to try to speak about in my epic. And when he invokes the muse here, it's not one of the historical sort of Greek or Roman muses, the, the daughters of Zeus or Jupiter. It's the Holy Spirit. These lines where he says, you were there at the very beginning when you sat brooding upon the wave. He's invoking the, the, the same spirit that was there when all of creation came into existence. And he has this line where he says that, that I intend to soar above the Aeonian Mount, which is, you know, poetes for uh, Mount Olympus. That he is just going to do something that is above and beyond what any of these other epic poets are doing. They're looking to the top of this mountain and he's looking to sort of the roof of the universe. And it's by telling this story similar to Chappelle and Chappelle show and the fact that there just doesn't seem to be very many sort of good sketch comedy shows that have come afterwards Milton just destroys the entire genre here this genealogy that we expect from poets of sort of what's the next rung in the chain he obliterates it by going round to the very beginning his act here is impossible to follow 
There can be no greater hero. There can be no larger people. It's just done. And afterwards, it's incredibly difficult to name a serious epic in poetry of any note. Milton himself tries to write another epic after this one and kind of sort of fails at it. He writes Paradise Lost and he tells this story and then he comes along behind it and tells Paradise Regained, which is a very strange poem in which sort of nothing happens. The, the highlight of it is the sort of the epic struggle that, he's, that he depicts in this poem is the temptation of Christ in the desert, which is defined by Christ doing nothing. The devil tries to egg him into doing various things, and Christ is passive. It's a different kind of story. It doesn't sort of fit the usual conventions of epic because even for Milton himself, there's no place to go. So instead, what we get after this is things like the rape of the lock. We get mock epic. We get the, the, the tremendous story of a bunch of people playing cards and a dude sneaks up behind this girl with a pair of scissors and cuts a lock of her hair off. That's the only space that is available to a poet because Milton just kills it. Arguably later it resurfaces in things like Lord of the Rings, in things like Star Wars, in fantasy and science fiction, because this sort of historical narrative is done. The beginning and the end of it are sort of both covered, and there's no space left for a poet to breathe. So instead what you have to do is to invent fictional worlds, and arguably that's where epic has moved to. So there's a quote uh, from a literary critic named Harold Bloom, who wrote a very famous book called uh, The Anxiety of Influence, that is all about poets trying to create work and navigating this space of being influenced by and indebted to the poets that came before them, but also trying to carve out their own space to, to be their own poet selves and to do their own thing. And he has this quote from an interview where he says, what we call a poem is mostly what is not there on the page. Harold Bloom says, the strength of any poem is the poems that it has managed to exclude. And this is very interesting for Milton because you can see him doing this on the page. Sort of erasing, wiping out, pushing aside all of these people that have come before him and, and sort of stamping his own claim on the genre. And nobody else has been able to do it since. So I think, unlike some of these other things where we can't say, you know, you can't get Jerry Rice and Randy Moss on the same field together, or you can't get Babe Ruth hitting against Nolan Ryan, these sort of athletic competitions. In the world of art, we are able to have these conversations more constructively and productively about who is the greatest of all time. And for me, uh, Milton is the GOAT. Thank you.